the more that you can tap into a great story that is emotional, appealing, it's true, of course, and it is personal, it is human, the more people will be interested in your business, especially investors. Welcome to the Kind Boss Podcast, brought to you by Outsourcing Angel, an Australian-based social enterprise that specializes in helping business owners free up their time and reduce staffing costs, while helping to create employment opportunities for people in developing countries. Visit OutsourcingAngel.com today. Now, let me welcome your host, Lynn Pedetti. Hello, kind listeners. I'm your host, Lynn Pedetti. Today, we'll be speaking to a kind boss, Francisca Easily, founder of Basic Bananas, The Business Hood, and Ocean Lovers. Francisca is a maverick entrepreneur, leading marketing and brand strategist, and mad adventurer. She is also the author of three best-selling books, Bananas About Marketing, Perception, and The Courage Map. In 2013, Francisca was awarded the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, recognizing her innovation, creativity, and philanthropic involvement. In addition to managing her businesses, she is a board member at the Global Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, and sits on the judging panel for Singularity University. Francisca is also a big believer in social business and is heavily involved in various ocean conservation and sustainability projects. Listen on as she shares how her expansive vision and eternal optimism makes her believe that there is no challenge that is too big for Francisca and how she harnesses her rare combination of being both creative and strategic to become a powerful leader in the business world. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Kind Boss Podcast. And today I have Francesca Easily. How are you? Excellent. <laughs> wow, your name was, how you pronounce this was excellent. Uh, thank you. And thanks for having me. <laughs> so your accent, where is that from? Oh, my God. Which accent? Don't have an Aussie accent, all right? Be honest. <laughs> no, I know. It's so funny. People always say, hey, what's your, your accent? I'm like, what accent? I've been, I'm actually Australian now. The funny part of this is that I have been in Sydney. In, in Australia for 15 years and I'm a Swiss, I'm a Swazi, Swiss Australian. So I grew up in Switzerland and I still have this crazy accent. You must have came when you were a lot later, right? Because when I came, I was only nine. So I kind of lost my Vietnamese accent. But what age did you come over? That's the age question, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I came at 23 and I'm 38 now. No, I'm 37. We're, we're not far off from each other. But yeah, once you get past 20 something, I don't think it's, yeah, it's too late. You can't change it. But where did Basic Bananas came from? And tell me more about Basic Bananas. Yeah. So one of our companies, which we started, I started this together with my ex-husband 11 years ago. And I came from advertising and branding. So when I was working in advertising, I realized that there is a gap for small business owners to get access to really good marketing and knowledge that we had in advertising. So a lot of our clients obviously were corporations that had big budgets and so they could afford us and our knowledge and our strategies, but not so much small businesses. And I live on the Northern beaches in Sydney. This place is full of small businesses and I would just see a lot of small businesses and and business owners struggle and and doing really bad marketing and, and the branding. And it was just, there's something missing here. And so my ex-husband and I started Basic Bananas with the purpose to educate small business owners and to mentor, to offer mentoring programs. And we've been doing this for 11 years now. The name, people always say, what about this name? You know, why is it called Basic Bananas? There's a funny story. So when we first started, I had no idea about business or how to run a business. I came from advertising and never had run my own business before. And so I had a mentor and she said, you can't call this business basic bananas. You need to call this something like Marketing Institute of <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, but nah. So I said, Sharon, I can't run a business called Marketing Institute Australia. It's not reflective of my brand at all. And I knew about branding. So I might not have known much about how to run a business, but I knew branding and marketing. And so we came up with all these different random names. The two finalists were Tango Like a Mango, it's a bit <laughs> What a cute name, but yeah, hard to pronounce or hard to say. Yeah, yeah. A bit too long for a name. And then we also had basic bananas and we sort of justified the name later. I mean, it's nice to have BB 
it's in a name that's quite nice. And also now people often when they, or in the beginning, even when they saw anything to do with bananas, they would send us pictures of bananas and jokes about bananas. So it was very good in terms of marketing and spreading the word. And also we then justified that, well, bananas make you happy. They have a happy thing inside mm -hmm. and ingredients. And also banana trees grow really fast. So we're all about marketing and basic because we are known for making marketing understandable. Mm. So is that kind of the typical process where you come up with a name that sounds catchy that you like and then try to give it a meaning? Or is this just your way, a random way, but normally it's not like that? No, it shouldn't be like that. So normally we also have a branding agency called The Business Hood and we, we do a lot of naming and brand building, brand identity, brand strategy. And you definitely don't want to do what we did. You definitely don't want to just get a name and then justify it later. It's better to have the story, have the identity and have the purpose and what do you stand for? And then from that, you come up with a name. So that's a little bit a better online. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. You know, my first agency, it was called Red and Black Solutions. And it was because my partner at the time had red hair and I had black hair. And we kind of go red and black solutions. <laughs> and I think, that, do you think that it's because, you know, when you're starting out, it's really hard to, if someone says, what's your story? What's your thing? It's really hard to articulate until you've been in business for so long that you, of course, if I start a new business now, I would care more about the story, the brand, like what's your thought on kind of startups and, you know, veteran entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think people should care about it from the beginning if they can. So I do think that now I work with a lot of also startups. It's not our demogra main demographic at Basic Bananas, but I'm also working, collaborating with Singularity University and I'm on their judging panel and do all of their branding strategies. And so there are a lot of startups there. And that those are quite unique businesses because they often are focused on making a big impact with technology, often innovations. And with them, I always say, you know, the more that you can tap into a great story that is emotional, appealing, it's true, of course, and it is personal, it is human, the more people will be interested in your business, especially investors. I've seen so many investor pitches. I always remember the ones that have a human story. You know, for mm -hmm. example, the guy who grew up with a grandma who had a stroke and then he wanted to figure out how he can help her relearn certain movements. And then he came up with this technology that helps people relearn how to move their bodies. That, those are the stories that you remember. So I do think that it makes sense and it's worth the effort to think about that from the very beginning when you start a business. Yeah. And I must say, you know, that agency business didn't really succeed. So there you go. Right. And I, even I started a nail polish business before that, and I did it because purely thinking I was going to make money. And so what, what's your thought on people starting a business because they think it's going to make money versus finding truly waiting for something to come along or wanting to start something that it has a bigger purpose? It's such a great question. And just when you, you know, even when you just said that, and I love your candidness and honesty, you know, like, I started nail polish. What was it called? It was called Chimera, Colors to Cater. You know, I, it was even CC locked up and looked like a Chanel thing. And I was really proud, but I wasn't even very girly back then. I hated wearing nail polish, but I literally thought I was going to make a million dollars in the first year because, hey, there's a billion females, right? <laughs> but it didn't turn out that way. Yeah, so even when you just said that in the very beginning before you asked me the question, I was thinking, wow, I wonder if that was a success because admitted is that you just started it for the money and that's something I'm seeing all the time in businesses is that the ones that are driven by something bigger than money, that are driven by making an impact, that are, are doing it because they really want to do it and they want to add value rather than just making money, money comes. And yeah. of course, you know, you don't have to only follow your passions. I don't believe in that. I believe in, in playing by your strengths. But then if you can focus on adding value rather than making money, you will make money. It's almost yeah. a given if you can add value. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So has Basic Bananas kind of evolved and changed over the last 10, 11 years that you've been in it? Like, was it different before and then now it's it looks different? It was sort of very similar for 10 years or so until the pandemic hit. Yep, yep. Oh, you know, the whole, this is the cool thing about when you have a very big vision, a very big purpose from the beginning. Often the purpose and the vision will stay the same if you truly believe in it. The way that you get there might change. So for us, when we first started, the vision was always to make marketing, mentoring and, and our programs available to business owners all around the world. And we started in Sydney first and we started with face-to-face -face workshops. So it was us teaching in groups of people. And we started in Sydney, you know, in the very first workshop, we had maybe three people attend. Mm -hmm. 
it was held at our accountant's office, so we didn't have to pay for, this is 11 years ago, we didn't have mm -hmm. to pay room hire because we couldn't afford it. And we had my mother-in-law and one of my friends and a stranger attend the first session. And this next session, maybe we had seven, and then we had 15, and then we had 20, and then 50, 100. And then we expanded into other cities. We then started running programs in Melbourne, in Brisbane, in Perth, Adelaide, all face-to-face. -face. And we then also trained mentors in our system so that they could run and deliver the programs. Our main program is a 12-month program where business owners come in. It's a small mastermind, small groups. They come in every month to work on their marketing with our mentors. And we had this in, in every major city in Australia, in Canada, on the, on the West Coast, US West Coast, Switzerland, and only just now starting Sweden. And we're also just looking at partnering with someone in the Middle East. And so when the pandemic hit, of course, we couldn't do face-to-face. -face, so we had to change everything to being online, online training and virtual workshops with the small groups. And in the first few months, March and, and April were wow, I haven't worked this hard in years. Mm. Change everything also to make sure that the team are not freaking out and everyone is staying calm and, you know, we're good. It's okay. We didn't have to let anyone go, luckily. So it, so it worked. And now, so that's the major change in the last probably five, six months. We've had to change to virtual. Yeah. Super duper well. Yeah. So would you say that prior to the pandemic, every year was predictable kind of like, you know, increasing growth and you felt like this is life right and the pandemic taught me that anything could happen around the corner like you just never know i'm surprised because because you're already online did you not have any online aspect to any of your training or program or was there already a little bit there was already a little bit of virtual but it was mainly our weekly help desk sessions were virtual and we had our online resources also for people to re-watch the sessions but we still had the face-to-face -face. and to be honest, I've wanted to do this for years. And you know, we sometimes had a little bit of a head butting with my business partner where I'm like, we need to do this virtually also as a solution because we have people in cities, in places, in remote villages here that can't come face yes. to face. We don't want to drive five hours to Sydney or to Melbourne. Or yes. What do we do with them? We do have also an online program, which is also good, but this is really the, the cherry on top program, the Clever Bunch. So it sort of forced us to do mm. something we wanted to do forever. And I'm glad that it forced us to do that because now we also are accessible to a much larger audience, which is really good. Yeah. So what were some of the key things you were doing during the pandemic? Like what was your leadership role like at that time? When you hit a crisis like this, I always say, and I say this also to, to my friends and partners, business partners, and I always say, when a crisis hit like this, there are people that will do really well and not because they're in the right industry they're just people that will do really well and then there are people that will not do well at all and generally what i'm seeing is that the people that are doing really well throughout the crisis a depression a recession are the ones that just go for you know they, they just go for it they they lead they're strong they're like okay i can see there is a poop storm out there but i'm focused here and i'm leading with courage and then there are people, and we have country partners. So we have people that are representing best brands in US, Sweden, Switzerland. And, and some of our country partners were in one camp. They just put their head in the sand. They're like, oh my God, it's a pandemic. I don't know what to do. And some, you know, they even admitted it. Some of them were like, hey, I just went down a rabbit hole for three days reading the news about this and watching videos. And I'm confused and scared and I don't know what to do. So then there are the ones that were like, okay. Let's do this. So, so my role for the first, I, I'm someone that does really well in a crisis. Mm. It just motivates me because I'm just like, okay, everyone is in crisis mode. Somebody needs to wear the big girl pants. So for the first few months, the focus was really about almost like calming everyone and, and leading with certainty. So as a leader, when you go through a crisis like this, somebody needs to make the decisions. There needs to be someone that, need, that makes a decision. And it's a very black and white decision. Often it's not like, Oh, maybe we can like, no, this is what we're doing. And everyone is doing this right now. And so there was a lot of that in the beginning. And of course, I doubted myself too. Sometimes I'm like, is this the right decision? But I wouldn't show it too much because the other people needed the certainty. So after maybe six, eight weeks, the team started to relax and go, okay, things are okay. We're safe. And I had to also keep reinforcing, hey, you're safe. You know, we got this. I do need you to help and collaborate. So we do come out of this 
stronger. And so, yeah, yeah there's a lot of that going on. That's amazing. It sounds so much like me and I felt like it was fire on our asses. Even all of our team felt the fire and it's actually refreshing because I've never seen you guys work so hard either. And you as a leader, right, we work hard. If I look back, I did regret I was panicking a little bit inside where I was like, let's try something else. And we were trying to sell services for, you know, trying to do a complete different service, what we were doing only to go, that didn't work. Did you try anything silly like that? Like we kind of went down to the path of just anything goes, you know, one small job if you want to outsource to us and kind of almost desperation, I would say. And then only a month later go, it's not going to work anyway. Yeah. And we went back to what we were doing. Did you try anything like that? I'm sure I've made a lot of silly decisions in my life, but I feel like through this time, I don't know why, but I've stayed super calm. I mean, very interesting. I mean, I had moments where I'm like, am I delusional? I mean, what's going on here? I must be delusional because I remember specifically i remember in quite in the beginning one of my dear friends one of my closest girlfriends she's amazing she's super smart she has an incredible position she has access to really good information we you know with what's going on also a little bit in the world and she called me like all the time and she said because she loves me she's like francisca have you stocked up on snacks is your cupboard full you need to get canned food you need to get frozen she gave me a whole list she sent me whatsapp messages you need to get frozen mangoes you need to get canned food i'm like i don't even like frozen mangoes and canned food no so i didn't stack up on anything also toilet paper it was too late by the time i thought that maybe i should get toilet paper there was no toilet paper anyway so there was a moment where i'm like i'm really not preparing for anything here i'm just working away and focusing on on the business and keeping everyone safe and i'm not eating different things I'm yeah <laughs> I'm buying some food that I like and fresh and vegetables and I you know buy the stuff when I need it and then I had moments of doubt where I'm like am I missing something because <laughs> one of my best friends who is incredibly smart and knows what's going on a little bit too I, I don't read a lot of media is forcing telling me that I need to buy stuff and she was super prepared but then I thought you know what she's so prepared she has like so much food at home if something happens I'll just go eat at her I was thinking exactly like you because I guess you know, living in Vietnam I live with very nothing so I knew that and we used newspaper as toilet paper back then so I'm like worst case I'll be resourceful want to make a difference in others lives Join us in providing food, medical supplies, and daily living necessities to tribal communities living in extreme poverty in the Philippines. For as little as $50, you can feed a whole village and have peace of mind that 100% of your donations goes directly to those in need. Be a part of our OA Love Projects and visit OutsourcingAngel.com. So what's your background? What made you think like that? Because I know my drive has come from almost poverty to, you know, and then now I can do anything. What is your drive and or the way you think? Such a great question. My mom would say when I grew up as a kid, she would often say I'm a little bit naive. Mm. I actually don't think it's that. So for a long time I thought, oh yeah, I guess I'm naive because she would always say, you're so naive in terms of like trusting. That's what yep. it comes back to. When I wrote this latest book I told you about, I suddenly had this epiphany that it's, you know what, it's not really naive. It's just that I trust that things work out and it's not really being stupid because when things get serious, I will prepare. Mm. Almost like, so growing up, I, I know I always trusted strangers when I felt like I can. I spoke to people. I go with the flow a lot more. I don't, I guess it's the, the thinking comes also from I'm very okay with unpredictability. In fact, mm. I love unpredictability. I guess that's why we are also in business, right? Because yeah. yeah. Unpredictable. And so I thrive a little bit on unpredictability, whereas other people, like my brother, for example, they need certainty. He needs to have a job where he knows money is coming in. And I don't know if how prepared he was for with food and stuff. He seemed pretty relaxed when I spoke to him. But I think that's more that. But then I realized that it's not so much that, it, that I'm naive. It's more that I trust that when I can, and with my intuition, and, and I trust that things work out. And then, you know, like I did think, I'm like, okay, if worse comes to worse, and there really is no food, and I don't have any food because I didn't prepare. I do live on the beach here. I can go fishing. Not that I, I don't want to kill fish. Yeah. I don't eat fish, but there are fish in the ocean here. You work it out, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Actually, did something that my mom said. I said, hey, I spoke to her a lot because she's 70 and in Switzerland, you know, they're close to borders. She was super re- relaxed, which was quite impressive. And I said to her, you know, the toilet paper situation here is not so good. It's like, <laughs> 
Just use newspaper. <laughs> Worst case, you're going to always wash it with water or whatever it is, right? But overall, so, so did you always have that belief, that faith that you knew you were going to be successful as well? Like you just knew that success was going to come. It's just a matter of when. I always ask myself, what is success? So I'm going to be successful in terms of having resources or financial resources. It's more, I think, that I always ask myself, what is success for me? And is it money? And it wasn't so much money, the driver. It's more freedom. So I feel like even as a... I have a word freedom on my arm. I love that. I got a feather here, which is the symbol for... Freedom. <laughs> but yeah, we're big on freedom. And that's why we work remotely. And yeah. One of my best friends has actually in Switzerland a tattoo like you were success freedom. It's really gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I get it in her. And so success for me was more like, okay, what, how do I know I'm successful? I'm successful if I have freedom. And so mm. I feel like even when I had no money, when I was in my 20s, when I was actually 19, 20, I worked a lot through high school to afford traveling. So I just went to South America for three months to travel backpacking, basically on a very, very small money because I had no money and like, you know, sleeping in dodgy places. And that for me was success. But I had freedom. So I'm like, I'm so successful. You know, like for me internally, I'm like not talking about it, but just I feel like I'm successful. And then only when I started working in advertising and I had a regular job, I didn't so much think that I'm not successful. I just felt like something is missing. And I didn't know what it was at the time until later when I realized it's because I didn't have freedom anymore. Mm-hmm. Because I had time to, to report to, I had to be there at a certain time. And that really... Yeah. Happened. So, you know, when it comes to freedom, it's my biggest value because I was deprived of freedom from my own parents. They were very controlling and all. What was your reason? Is there, a re- is there like a lack of freedom? Or what is that drive for freedom that made you strive for it that's a great question i'm not 100 percent sure but when i do think about growing up switzerland is quite conformist society mm. so my, my parents actually were pretty cool with with freedom they actually did allow me quite a lot of freedom and maybe not so much my dad but he was never really there but my mom was very quite open-minded even when you know when i was a teen and i was partying a lot actually mm. i never liked it but he just didn't really know what was going on my mom is like okay i guess she's coming home or not tonight <laughs> and she was pretty cool and I was quite you know the party girl in in my late teens early 20s and so that's not so much that I didn't have it I think but then when I look at I was 16 and I, I lived in Costa Rica for a year with a Costa Rican family and oh my god I had zero freedom because I just wanted to keep me alive I was 16 years old in a new country learning the language and I mean Costa Ricans you know <laughs> I was like I was like you know pretty much the meat in the streets that is easy to go. My family just wanted to keep me safe. And so I had zero freedom and it was the best year, but it was also incredibly challenging because I was, I wasn't, I had to be home at 16. I mean, in Switzerland, I was partying at 16. I had to be home at six o'clock at night. I wasn't allowed to go out a lot. We had to sneak out with my sister, my host sister. Anyway, but then, so that was definitely a challenge. And Switzerland as a society is quite rules driven. And I feel like maybe that made me realize that, oh, wow, like yeah. this, it's so conformist. I don't want to be so conformist. So maybe that was one of the drivers. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. No, excellent answer. So, so your book, actually, I want to talk about your book, actually, before I get, continue to talk about that basic banana. Yeah, share with me your latest book. What is it about? Yeah, so this latest one here is called The Courage Map. Mm-hmm. It came out in May, start of May this year, 2020. And it took me almost two years from start to finish with all, you know, then working with a publisher and getting this baby to be amazing. And it started actually a few years before. So a few years before, and it's so funny, I was just talking to the guys who, who hired me to go work at Mind Valley as a publisher. So Mind Valley sent, sent me, brought me over to Malaysia to record a program on being bold i know the the founder i mentioned to you earlier vision so you're going to be one of the program there right. like course because I, I i have the all access mind valley thing and i do courses all the time i don't have any access and i'm not a really <laughs> but i have a few programs there's one on the quest one that's the the bold one i think is on the quest app oh okay i'll check it out again maybe it is there and i, I missed it okay yep yeah, someone just told me the other day they found it. So it should be on the Quest, I think. Mm-hmm. And then there's one with, with Archid on the Ever Coaching one. We did a, a workshop program. Anyway, so a few years ago, I went to Malaysia to record this one on, on being bold. And it was just because I think Vision 
knew me and then his team said, hey, do you want to do something? I said, sure. And that's where it started. I'm like, oh, this topic, I really like it. And I like talking about it. And so then two years ago, I started a motorcycle trip from Switzerland to Kazakhstan along the Silk Road. And it was one of the most challenging <laughs> adventures I've ever been on. And one of my friends joined me. And he said, Mike, he said, hey, he asked me the question, hey, are you never scared? I mean, do you not have fear? Just the way that you, you know, interact with people and, and how you operate. I'm like, yeah, of course I have fear. You know, it's a human reaction and I definitely have it. I just still take action despite the fear. And so he said, hey, you should maybe write a book on this. So that's where I started writing the Courage Map is on this trip. Wow. Is, is there a certain number of steps that it takes for people to get out? And what's the result? It's like from someone that's fearful after you read the book, like what, what's the result you're, you're aiming to get for people? Yeah, so the book has 13 principles and, and you know, I'm, I'm not saying you need to embrace them all, but each of these principles are here to support people. It doesn't matter, you know, how fearful or not fearful you are, are helping people to have more courage and to, to be courageous despite the fear. And what I talk about in the book is that we all have courage boundaries and they're different in different areas. You know, I might, my courage boundaries might be, quite large in one area, but maybe they're really small in, in a different area. Like for example, a bit better now, but I used to be a little bit not amazing at facing difficult conversations. I would just conflict a little bit. And so that in that area, my courage boundary was really tiny. So there are principles that, that I could apply and use to help me to expand that courage boundary in that area. And what I'm saying is that different people have different boundaries. And no matter where you're at, you can grow them. So would you say it's like a muscle? The more, face, the more fears you face, the easier it gets, right? Totally. And you know how you get older? Often also the more existential fears are more prevalent. So for example, I look at my own life. You know, when I was in my 20s, I was maybe borderline reckless, but I would surf bigger waves and I would do more crazy yep. adventures. And then as you get a little bit older, you get a little bit more conscious about the risks. And yep. so... Now I just need to, when I notice that if I go for a surf and the surf is a little bit big and I'm like, oh, should I go out? I have to sometimes push myself and like, no, I can definitely do this. It, I'm not risking my life here. I can do it. It's just I need to go out anyway. I guess when we're older, we have more to lose, right? When we're young, we have nothing to lose. But now, especially when I have kids and, and you have a business to say, you're like, okay, what will happen? But yeah. All right. Because um, I promise you it's going to be a half an hour thing. So I'm going to go back to go, go to my next segment. This is called the high five. So it's, I'm asking you five questions where you choose this or that so that we get to know you personally more, right? Yeah. So easy questions. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Number one, banana cake or banana smoothie? Smoothie. Oh, I forgot to, the other rule is to elaborate on your answers. Banana smoothie. Here's the funny story. I don't really like bananas. When we started this business, I'm never going to be a fan of bananas. So I don't eat bananas except in smoothies. I love bananas. Uh, I just feel like eating a banana is like a baby. You know, this. <laughs> I'm glad I asked that question because when I'm obvious, she likes banana. That's why, you know, <laughs> but then it's good to know you don't even like banana, but yeah. All right. Number two, crazy in love or crazy rich? Crazy in love. Yeah. But I just think love is one of my number one values. Actually, this is my number one value. It's love, trust, freedom, and courage and impact. And love, I just think love is the most amazing thing in the world. And it's not just love, romantic love, but love for anything. Yeah. Yesterday I was sitting here, it was raining so hard here in Sydney. And there were two little lorikeets on my balcony. And they looked a little bit wet, the poor guys. So I gave them some food and they came down and they were eating the seeds. And then they were sitting next to each other on the railing. I was watching them forever. You know, normally birds sit like a little bit apart. They were sitting close and they were like, you know, pecking yeah, yeah, yeah. up. Like these guys are in love and this is like beautiful. I just think love is everywhere and love is the most beautiful thing ever. Do you know that's my number one value too? And my company, if you look at it, it's love. That's our, because I read the book called Your One Word from Evan Carmichael. And it's really about finding your one word. And, one, and it was love. <laughs> we, we... But I love that. And yeah, I can see why you would love that. <laughs> All right, number three, whales or dolphins? Oh my God, this is a tough one, but I'll go for dolphins. I love them both. I go for dolphins because I think dolphins are just, they're fun, they're playful. We have a lot of dolphins going past my house here and I always watch them. They're just cheeky. And they also, they stay together in a, mm. a school. 
and they're very loyal. They ha- whales often you see alone cruising around mm. are together and they play with each other. They come out and do charms out of the water and they're very, 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 very intelligent. Awesome answer. And we, I didn't even get a chance to talk about your whole, you know, philanthropy or sorry. Number five, I think this is my last, no, fourth, meditation or journaling? Meditation. I do both. I, I love journaling too. I definitely meditate every day. Some meditation is thing I do every day and I don't always do it at the same time. I don't always do it the same way. Sometimes I sit, sometimes I lie, sometimes I'm on the beach, sometimes I'm in bed waking up and then fall back asleep. So call this meditation. And I love meditation. It's just a way to connect again with myself. And I journal when I need answers. So I journal, but I journal more when I'm going through a challenge. Awesome. Number final one, singing or dancing? I'd say dancing. I enjoy singing, but I'm not very good. (laughs) We have a band and I do a little bit of the harmonies. I'm not the the main singer. and I'm not a very good singer. And dancing, I would go for dancing because I just love dancing. I often dance on my own. Anytime when I need a little bit of an energy lifter, if I just pump the music and even just dance to get ready, I love it. I love moving. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Okay. That's the high five question there. Well, I've just got two questions for you, but before I go to my next two questions, how do people connect with you? Yeah. So the best place is either on my personal website, which is Francisca easily or basic bananas. So for if the listener, the viewer is a business owner, I recommend you go to basic bananas dot com and on there we have a ton of free resources we run virtual summits that are for free we have a pj party which we started because of covid which is a weekly session on a specific topic to help people so there's a ton of resource there awesome social media linkedin i don't always check all my linkedin messages but one of my team is so if you yeah can. it seems like you make learning and marketing so fun it's like even the name says it banana is right <laughs> all right my last two questions for you since it's a kind boss podcast what does the kind boss mean to you a kind boss wow i think kindness is one of the most important traits of a of a leader and in the book it's actually one of the principles too is kindness and a kind boss is someone who always responds with kindness doesn't mean that you can't be firm. So as a boss, you can be firm and you have to sometimes be firm and you have to give guidance, but you can always, no matter what, even if somebody makes the biggest mistake or is really challenged or challenged or challenging you, I feel like this mantra of always responding with kindness is what makes a kind boss. Beautiful said. Yes. Kindness doesn't mean too nice or weak. No. Good one. Last question for you. What do you want the world to remember you for? I would love people to remember me for someone who was living true to to myself and also for someone who made an impact with everything that I do. So my personal mission right now, and this might change again, but right now my personal mission is to create ripple effects, create positive impact through entrepreneurship. So leveraging business especially to make an impact in different areas. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Francisca. I really enjoyed it. I wish I could have more time and talk to you more. I'm sure I'm going to pick your brains again. And I'm glad we live in Sydney, so I'll be catching up with you. But thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And thank you for having me. Thank you for joining our podcast today. We hope this interview has inspired and humbled you to be a kind boss. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and let us know what you think about our show. If you have any questions, please visit OutsourcingAngel.com. Until then, stay kind and spread love.